Rethinking innovation, that's been our theme of this uh, conference, to take a look at ourselves and change um, our processes, how we do business. And um, that brings us to our keynote speaker. Every once in a while, I believe, if uh, we are lucky enough in life, we can um, combine our passion, what we're good at, um, our skill set, um, our jobs, our talents, with a what I call a purpose. Something that is actually bigger than us, something that goes back to humanity, to our communities. And in fact, our next speaker is one of those people. I've actually known him for a few years, and it's been a pleasure uh, to hang out with him and learn from him. Uh, he was an early pioneer of digital mobile marketing. He started a few companies and uh, sold the last two uh, to BlackBerry and Publicis. Uh, Publicis is a, ma is a massive, giant media and uh, uh, advertising agency on a global basis. But then he went off to start uh, Epic Foundation, which we'll hear from about today. And this is an organization that is focused on giving back, uh, rethinking how we give back to our communities on a global basis, which reminds me that we are, in fact, part of the same humanity, uh, no matter where we live or what language we speak or what accent we have. Uh, Mike and I ran into him totally by accident at uh, South by Southwest last, last year and had a conversation. And because, indeed, we are a global company, with partners that are all across the world. We felt we should invite him to have him speak and to um, tell us, to inspire us, how we can also give back to our individual communities and to the world. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to Alexandre Mars. Thank you, Thank you Tyre. Uh, Thank you for the uh, kind introduction there. Usually when people ask me to uh, talk, it's about innovation. And when we uh, discussed with Tyre, and he mentioned the theme this year, we think innovation. So I said to myself, those guys at Broadsoft are bold and smart at the same time. We're not talking about innovation, we go a step further. And when I read the news on Monday, I said, it's great. I'm not the only one to think those guys are good. Talking about innovation and what we do at Epic, Epic, we're trying to rethink one industry. We're trying to innovate in an industry that may be one of the oldest industries in all time. Do you have any clue which industry it is? What's the oldest industry in the world? Anyone? Politics? Food? Sex? Yeah? It's the industry of giving. It's maybe one of the oldest industries in the world. And it's interesting. It didn't really change for so many years. That's what we do at Epic. We want to make giving the norm. Because what we see out there, everywhere, is not something we can accept. How can we change this? Not only being judgmental with people, but providing solutions, everyone here, everyone. We know solutions. We're selling, we're buying solutions every single day. So why should we eat it differently when, he's talking, when we talk about giving? So let's introduce myself first. Um, my family is from southwest of France. They moved to the US 50 years ago. And after a while, they moved back to Europe. My mom was in the social world, very, very involved in many social causes. My dad's an entrepreneur, made me realize that hard work will be necessary. When I was 15, I wanted to change the world. When I was 17, I realized that money will help. So <laughs> I started my first venture. Um, I was 17, though that's the air style, that's my team. They make, made fun of my air styles. Anyway. I got my first money running those uh, concerts. Then I started my journey in the tech community. 
I built one of the first web agencies in Europe. And this not the, that's this not the right picture, because the right picture is me, beard, ponytail, baggy jeans. And I was trying to go after people saying, trust me, next will be the internet. And for the ones who remember I was in, I was in France at the time, was something called Minitel. Anyone remember Minitel? Yeah? <laughs> All time, right? But still, I was trying to convince people, trust me, next big thing will be the internet. Super hard until the day the internet really popped up. And then suddenly, I was super clever. Not because I was clever, but because I was young. And then I sold this one, and I started something new in the mobile industry. Very similar, um, I said, that's the next big wave. And I went to see exactly the same people I went to see a few years before, saying, for, for, forgot what I told you about just the internet. Now the next big thing is, is mobile. And it was hard, as always, uh, when you start something um, early. Um, but at some point, just um, someone helped me a lot. Um, this name, his name is Steve Jobs. Because in 07, Jobs announced the iPhone. And suddenly, I was trying to sell this stuff to a lot of people. But then, I was lucky. People said, oh, yeah, I heard this thing coming. Maybe I should, help. I should just do something with you. And another big organization acquired us. Then I moved on, and I moved on the, um, social media. And in the same way, I said, that's where well, the past. Mobile is the past. Now it's social media. Trust me. And so I went to see exactly the same people I went to see five years ago, 10 years ago. I said, and then at some point, they started you know, trusting me. I said, mm, you understand pretty well what people want, so we should work with you. And we sold this one to BlackBerry. So if you remember BlackBerry, they had something called BBM. They are BlackBerry Messenger system. And I was, again, very lucky. In 2013, Twitter went public. And when Twitter went public, um, BlackBerry came over saying, how is it possible that Twitter with 140 million users uh, can get a valuation of 18 or 19 billion dollars when us at BlackBerry, we are not able to monetize BBM. So that's how and why they acquired us. That was 20 years-ish of running businesses and using innovation because that's what we, we discuss here. How can we think differently? How can we use open innovation? How can we use design thinking to have a different answer to anyone, anyone's needs? Then I said, it's time to switch back to who I am. What I want to do when I was 15, the difference is very important. Now I have the money. Um, I worked hard to get there to that point, but what can I do now with that money? And then when I started Epic. So when I started Epic, I didn't know enough about social good. So I said, let's do a market research. All of us, when we start something, we do a market study. We go and we ask people questions. And I did the same. So first, I did it in, in Western Europe and in the US, going after philanthropists, social entrepreneurs, policy makers. And then after we said, and we discussed with my wife, and we said, let's take the kids out of school and let's travel the world to go to so many places, understanding how can we change the way people give and how can we use innovation to get there. So we travel, we met a lot of very interesting people. And we ended, we ended with one question. I was looking for a pattern, something I can find would be very similar in uh, Peru or in, in Russia or in Australia. And this is a question I will ask you today. So I will try to get some interaction with you. It won't be just a, a, a perfect workout session, but still. Can you raise your hand if you have given money to a social organization last year? Can you just raise your hand? And keep your hand up, please, um, if you think you have given enough. Yeah, oh, a couple of them. That's what I realized. Wherever I was going, wherever I was going, people were answering, I would have loved giving more. But for so many reasons, I did not. And why? Always the same reasons. Why? And what's holding us back to give more? Three main reasons. One, we don't trust social organizations. Lack of trust. We don't trust them. Uh, two, lack of time. Look at this. It's super hard. We have so much to do. 
Um, and three, a lack of knowledge. You are super good in what you do, and that's why you are here. The point is, social is different. How you can understand something, or how you can really be involved if you don't understand something well. And that's why we all do the same. We give money to our school, to our kids' school, to a church, synagogue, mosque, and sometimes to the hospital. And that's already something very good. But how can we get to the next level? And that's why I'm here. And again, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Ter. Thank you, the amazing Broadsoft team. Bring solutions, providing solutions to people. Um, so first, back to the lack of trust. We said, let's do like a P firm, like a, a VC, like a venture capitalist. In the way we were just trying to find the best organization tackling one industry is the uh, uh, children and youth industry sector. So what we've been doing, we've been going after 100 plus partners from the Gates Foundation to Ashoka, from Dazra in India to Robin Hood in New York. Amazing people are doing already the work of vetting organizations. And that's what we do. Every year we go after them and say, can you share with us your top organizations? This year we have analyzed 3,500 applications coming from the network. That after we said 35 is way too many. So let's use tools to get to the point where we'll get, you know, 10-ish organization every year. So we have 45 data points. So we take this big number, we spend seven months, and at the end of the seven months, we have only 10 new organizations selected. That, those organizations will be out doing three to five plus years. And after, we'll also part of it do an on-site inspections. But that's a selection model. Because when we give money somewhere, we want to be sure that the money will be well used, right? We want to be sure that the money will be well funneled. Because if I'm asking you to invest in any businesses, you won't have you give your money, or you won't invest your money if you're not sure that the money will be just uh, will get to the point where you want the money to go. Second, it's great to have a selection, but after, I want to be sure that the money is really used, and that's all about the monitoring and the evaluation. And it's not only just a report they can give twice a year, but it's also an app. So you can have an app, and on your mobile application, you will be able to see how many of those kids got a shot in or appeal in Uganda two weeks ago? Or during the last snowstorm in New York, how many of those kids went to a shelter and got a meal? Um, that's something we should be able to get. Why we should wait a year now to receive a very old school report where you will never read anyway because it was in the past. We want to have the tools that we all use every single day. And you know what? It's interesting because those tools exist. Then you can select well. You can monitor the money you are just uh, uh, investing. But then what about the experience? And the experience is barely what you have you know, the last three days. Is meeting people, is engaging with people, is you know, listening to those amazing leaders. But that is the same there. So we say, go and visit organizations. Please go, spend time, bring your families. Spend time with those entrepreneurs and those beneficiaries. And also for the ones we're not able to go there, and that's why I brought here. We've been filming all those organizations in virtual reality. So um, we'll be outside after if you want to try this. Because if I'm, anyone watched this movie, Slumdog Millionaire here? Remember this movie? Yes? Yeah, a lot of people, I'm sure. So th this movie has been shot in uh, Mumbai, in this slum in Mumbai called the Ravi. The life expectancy in this place is 39 years old today, 39. So we know it's not, it's, you know, it's not good and we know it's bad, but the goal is how can you be engaged there? And when you get those goggles, you understand why it's important to be part of this movement. That's what we see. Um, and that's the, 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 the kind of tools we're providing. So that's really just, what we've been building um, to help people to give better. And that's as entrepreneur and for the ones here, um, entrepreneurs is always what we're looking for. Point A, where we are, and point B, where we want to go. And as I asked you earlier, we are at that point. We give, but we all want to give more. And the good thing is the space between A and B is so wide 
that you have a business to build against this. That's what I realized year, you know, months after months, years after years. But then I realized something also. This was not enough. I'm able to provide you and to just answer to your left side of your brain. I'm able to explain to you how this money will be well used. But how can we improve, increase the money you can give? And, and I will just start this giving more with the, the story of my daughter. She is six, and she lost a fur tooth a few weeks, a few months back now. The tooth fairy came over, put two dollars under the pillow. The following day, the following day, my daughter came over, and she handed over the two dollars to me. I said, "Dad, so those two dollars are for the kids you are helping at Epic." What's interesting about the story? At six years old, she was able to give 100% of her wealth <laughs> in her bits. So it was interesting. Uh, but what is more interesting is not only my family, is not only my daughter, is more and more and more people. That's what we see. And that's why I did introduce myself, sharing with you the fact that I was always able to see and to, to see or foresee what will be next and something you all know, but something interesting because we can back this with numbers. Stanford, this year, 20% of the undergrads, any one year with kids you know, above 15 understand this very well. 20% of them, they want to work in the social sector or become social entrepreneurs. Other one, 80%, 80% of the generation Y and Z, they want to work for organization that will just matter. We, 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 we just uh, care about how they contribute to society. I was with someone yesterday, very interesting thing. If I have another number here, even if the, 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 the money you will get uh, is just um, is, is less. When you go at Coke, when you go at Procter & Gamble, if you ask them the second or third question during the interview process of this new generation is no longer the size of the office. That was you know, the question that we're asking. <laughs> so what's the, what's the size? I've, I'm sharing the office with someone. I hope now, you know, great pedigree, just amazing bio. I should get to know an office by myself. What kind of company car I will get? That's the kind of question we were asking. This generation, no more. This generation, the question they ask is, what the purpose? What the action? If you make money, wonderful. That's why I want to work for and with you, but what will you do with this? And if we are not able to answer this question, they will stop working for us. Um, and at some point, they will stop buying our product. So it's very interesting. And that's why we were, at least I would say I was, was I was part of the me generation. Me, myself, and I. This generation is different. It is what we call the we generation. And when you discuss with them, it's very interesting. The currency wise, you know, for me it was the dollar, for others it was the pound, the euro, whatever. The new currency for them is different. Purpose is the new currency. And I can tell you it changes everything. Why? Because in three years from now, three years, not 20 years, 50% of the global workforce will be a millennial, like we call them. Three years. And we want to recruit them. We want to retain them. And more importantly, I think, for most of us, those kids are our kids. And when we come home and we ask him, Michael, amazing success, but when he's coming home, saying, how was your day, Dad? And he's saying, oh, 1.9 billion. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's amazing by the way, big up, very amazing. But still, I'm sure the kids will also ask, okay, what else? And if, and if the what else is, you know what? A size of it will go to social good. A size of it will just be shared with people in need. Then you get everything. And that's the changes we're seeing now. We are not only in a world where it's all but ourselves. And that's the introduction again, thank you Tara for this so kind introduction. We need to be something bigger than ourselves. That's where we are now. So having said this, 
what do we see now in terms of using social good within organizations? So CSR is a way to handle this very badly most of the time, <laughs> I have to say, um, because very, we're not connected with the, the real needs of the employees. Maybe some of you have been running 5Ks, 10Ks in the past for codes. And we do also this. You know, how many of you have been painting somewhere? Uh, anyone have been sent somewhere to you know, paint? Not, not a ton. OK, some. Because usually, just uh, organizations love doing this. Let's go to the inner city school, and let's go and paint. So we've been building a generation of painters. <laughs> That's what we're doing. But honestly, do you really think is enough? It's not. And we know this. So what kind of solutions we're providing at Epic? I should have added something also. We are a nonprofit. It means everything we, we do is at no cost. So we don't charge people. Everything you will see here, or everything I mentioned earlier, we don't charge people. So if tomorrow you want to join us, it will be all the money we will receive will go to the organization. I'm self-funding everything myself. Because it has to be pure. And it's epic as a movement. It's certainly not, it's certainly not a, a for profit. Um, first, before this, uh, I like this one. Three types of business leaders. The first type, um, you, know, you know him at least, uh, Gates. What we call the social good activist. Even if what they do is will have a negative impact on his you know, bottom line, he will do it because he understands it's important for the society. At the opposite of the spectrum, we have the Uncle Scrooge. You remember the Uncle Scrooge? He's in pretty bad shape those days. Um, because we don't want to work for him anymore. We don't want to invite him at home. We don't want to talk to him. At least if we maybe still won't, the next generation, they don't want. And then the rest is us. It's you, it's me. We're pragmatic. We will do good, mostly because we understand it's better. It's better for our employees, it's better for our customers, and it's better for our families. Very important. So solutions-wise, one, what we call the payroll giving. Payroll giving, we all receive paychecks, hopefully. Um, in the US, every other week, and you know, elsewhere, every month. You know that's on your paycheck. Wherever you, wherever you leave, it's never random. At the end of your paycheck is always 25 cents, 65 cents. So what we do, we go and work with organizations and ask your employees to give away whatever they want after the dot, or after the comma in Europe. Super easy. And then the company can match this up. So, and then after it's not, the CEO will decide where to put the money. But the employees will have to vote for codes. So what's interesting in that case is that everyone can be part of it. Everyone can be part of it. And then they will decide and they will vote for an organization. So the, the, the person at the very bottom of the organization will have the same voice that the CEO of the organization. I mentioned we've just launched this with uh, Christian Dior. I'm sure you've, you've been, you, know, you know them, iconic luxury brand. And you're doing it. And you should say why they do this. They shouldn't have any issues recruiting people and retaining people and buying and selling the product. Still, they have some issues. And there's a the way to do it. So it's a way you can, it's what we call the ram down. So very easy, painless, systematic, and optional. People love this one. A goal epic when I say we want to make giving the norm is in five years from now, 50% of our organizations, wherever we work, have to propose this to us as employees. Because then you can imagine if, and if it's a tiny, 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 but when we are adding tiny, tiny bits, it becomes big. Second one we love is the transactional giving. How many times this week we have been using our business or credit card or, or debit card? Five times, 10, 15 times. Every time when I'm going, having lunch, buying uh, the tickets, going to do anything, I should have the option when I'm paying to rent up the amount to the next dollar amount. Should be super easy, super, again, um, optional. I'll give you an example. Uh, like those guys, if you have to choose between Uber and Lyft, 
I'm sure it's easy to decide in the US, do Lyft. Lyft, super easy. When you get to ride with Lyft, at the end of the ride, we'll ask you it was $8.25. Do you want to bring it up to $9? Super easy. You can select the organization you want to send the money to. Again, painless, systematic, and optional. After a good day, a great day, sure, I can give 75 cents. After a bad day, no way I will give money away. But it's our decision. Then um, why it works. How many of you have a car here? Can you just raise your hand? A car, seal? Car owners, yes. You remember when we go to the gas station? Uh, we go to the gas station and we pump, we pump. We don't want to have something that was, you know, zero, zero at the end. That's not the same for you, right? But that we do the same. Giving to ran up or ran down is easy. But it's part of who we are. It's fine to get the zero, zero at the very end. So that's why it, it works well. Um, and another solution um, for entrepreneurs is the sharing pledge. For entrepreneurs or investors, we have this. So entrepreneurs were joining us saying, we want to be part of the epic movement, but we don't make money yet. So how can we be part of it? We said, easy, pledge your shares. So if tomorrow you start a business, or if you are just already running a business, pledge some of your shares. It could be 0.1%, 10%, whatever is painless for you. But pledge the, pledge the shares now. And maybe in five years from now, or 10 years, or, tw or 19 years, like Broadsoft, you'll be acquired by an amazing organization. And that day, you know, what you have really just built uh, will go also to social good. Easy, painless, systematic, and optional. And we do this with entrepreneurs. We do this with investors. Um, just we'll be announcing on Thursday this week um, something with a, a huge PE firm uh, based in New York and London. Um, what we have done with them is very easy. When you, um, when you are a PE firm, you know you take 2% of the management fees and usually 20% of carry of interest on the money you will make. What they agreed, it's a 1.2 billion fund, is to give 1% of the carry. So, and the goal is the same. In the next five years, 50% of the entrepreneurs in Phoenix, in Milano, in New York, in Paris, will pledge the size of their shares to social good. And we're not asking those to give to Epic. Maybe they want to give somewhere else, but we believe it's important that we have to do this. Same with investors. We hope that in the next five years, 50% of the new fund will have this at the core of what they do. So we do them, we do this sharing pledge. So the reasons why it works, I'm sure it's pretty obvious now, um, just ending the talk. It has to be painless. It has to be systematic, and it has to be optional. That's what we see. And if we do this, then we can change the system. Because I'm more than sure that everyone here, even if we talk about technology, even if we talk about just changing the world using technology, I'm sure you're like me. You don't like what we see. You, know, you don't accept what is not acceptable. And the good thing is we have this power. And we cannot only wait governments and states to do everything. I think they're doing whatever they can. It's on us now. We are a civil society. We are running businesses. We are just doing a lot of good things. How can we embed this at the core of who we are? That's what we do at Epic. Um, and something important also, a lot of people are coming to see me after those talks asking, what do you think I should give? Because I ask you the first question at the very beginning. Have you given enough? Have you given enough? And most of you said no, but what is enough? <laughs> it's another question. And what we always answer, I don't know, I cannot give a number. Depending of your religion, depending of your childhood, depending of your age, maybe it's different. What I can tell you is try to define your pain point regarding giving. So for some of you, maybe it would be 1% of, you, of your earning. Maybe it would be 5% of your wealth. But please, never cross that line. Define this number. Never go beyond this number. But please, don't go you just know, um, too low <laughs> either. Um, so that's what we do at Epic. We provide solutions. We think, and about this, uh, this talk, we're trying to think and rethink innovation every single day. We are trying to see how can we hear this, but in that case, to make a better world. That's what we do in, as a call to action. Those solutions exist. So wherever you work, for whatever just uh, organization, friends you have, please join us. That's what we are asking. And as you can see at the very bottom of it, we don't charge. A goal is to put and to make giving 
becoming the norm in the next five to 10 years. So you have, that's, that's Bill Society, and you have all my details now. So please join Epic. Thank you so much, and again, uh, thank you for the invitation, Michael and Tyre.